getting used to the disembodied voice sound. Okay, good, got it. Um, so my name is Jamie Strollo, and I'm a designer at Betterment. I'm really excited to be here, and I'm super psyched to get to talk really specifically about the work that we do, because I was told that's what y'all want to hear, so I love doing that. So we're going to talk about like a specific project, actually. Um, so I'm very, very excited to be here. So just to get it out of the way, what is Betterment, in case you didn't know? Um, it's an automated investing service. So right now, we have 180,000 customers, and we're managing about five and a half billion dollars under, uh, or we have a five and a half billion dollars under management. Um, so the tagline is investing made better through smarter technology. So I am on the team that helps build that. So what I want to focus on today is where do customers fit into this process? So basically the way that we're working right now as product designers at Betterment, uh, we validate new products by incorporating customer research into the product development process every single time. So I just want to talk a little bit about how we structure product um, design and engineering together and just to kind of set the stage of how we kick off a project. So I am working on the financial planning squad. So we do squads and pillars at Betterment. Um, we're working in agile-ish development. So we work alongside, we're building, we're designing and building to, at the same time, but like the UX work has to happen first. So I think with a lot of, like a lot of places, it's kind of take what you like of agile and, and make it work. Um, so we can't work completely agilely, but, but we, we work pretty quickly together. Um, that has gray circles. It does, okay, that's not looking great. Anyway, so the way that it works is each squad, there's the leadership of the squad, there's a product manager who's at the heart of it, and then there's a lead designer and a lead engineer. And so we're uh, partners. So when we kick off every project, we all start from beginning to end, we're together. So um, how does that work? So each quarter we go through, there's like a bunch of proposals and they come in from all different places. Um, I'm gonna talk about one specifically that was pretty recent. Um, and then what happens is, so product and design, we start like the UX work together. So we do a lot of validation um, first. So we'll do interviews, which is what I'm gonna talk about. Um, we do some designs and then we test those designs. So we'll use like prototypes and, and real lightweight prototypes to kind of get an idea. And then it passes and design and engineering now start working together uh, simultaneously. So we actually, from that design, we start building and then we test the build actually. And then we go back through that cycle. Um, and then we'll do a beta test or an A-B test depending on, on what, uh, how big the launch is and what we're trying to accomplish with it. So product design at Betterment. So this is the team I'm on. And a lot of the fellow product designers came out tonight, which is really, really nice. Um, so right now, this is kind of what we're doing. These are our areas of focus. And this is changing as we expand and grow. Um, we're actually actively hiring UX researchers right now. So it's kind of interesting. This is like a moment in time of when we're still like a startup um, in nature. So, and it's funny, I was talking to Kat, my manager, about this and you know, so this is what we're doing. We're doing research, then we move on to flows and wires where we start validating. We do visual design, which is actually becoming less and less because we are using a living style guide. So we're now kind of like to make sure that everything stays really consistent. And then we do user testing too. And it's just an interesting, Kat pointed out, like most of what we do is invisible. So to get to something really simple, we're actually spending all this time to get to one conclusion, but you're not gonna, no one really sees all of it, which I think is, is really interesting. Um, so how do we build new products? So the ideal project proposal would come in and it would, we would be able to answer these questions. So what is the problem we're actually trying to solve right now? What will success look like and how will we measure that success? And what are our constraints? So those could be design, engineering, could be data, it could be all kinds of things. So sometimes though, they come in like this, and this is a lot to look at, and it's supposed to be. Um, so this is a, the project I wanted to talk about where we made an, an, an app guide, an application guide um, for the product. And what was really cool about this project is it came in from the data team. 
So the data team and some key stakeholders around the company were like, these are all these things that if customers were doing them, they'd be even more successful. And then it also came through with a, also you should make a checklist, and also um, they should be in this order. This is what we think is the best order. So there's like a lot of great here, and it's been really great to collaborate with them, but there's a few things. If I go back to what questions I'm answering and what problems I'm solving, what's missing from this? So the fact that customers aren't doing those things is actually still a betterment problem because the customer doesn't know it's a problem. So, or I don't know that the customer knows it's a problem. So it's just interesting. So I need to answer that question. What is the customer problem here? Like, why aren't they doing it? Like, they can do all of those things from that giant list. Why aren't they doing it? Um, so, and then we needed to define, like, what is success? So is it that they're doing some of those things, all of those things? Like, do they turn them all on? Is success also, like, customer service gets less calls about how to do things like that? Is that a way we measure? Um, and then constraints, just how much time do I have to work on it? How much time, how many engineers do we get? Like, um, can the data team collaborate with us to make sure that we're, we're pulling data really well um, and tracking things really well? So how do we get started? So I, this is like a truncated process. Um, I just want to talk about my favorite parts, I guess. Um, and all of these things are stolen, so go ahead and steal them. Um, I'm, you know, I'll reference where, where we sort of have cobbled together how we can do um, research without a research team and sort of how we can do things on the fly and do things quickly but still actually validate things with customers. Um, so we'll talk about assumption gathering um, and then conducting actual customer interviews and then just good ways we found to share uh, what we found to make sure that it actually gets incorporated, right? Because if it was just us and the squad that like knew all this great information, how would we get that out and make sure that other people were going to use it? Um, so assumption gathering. So this is an, uh, we adapted this from UX for Lean Startups by Laura Klein. So there's a link in the deck. I don't know if I can provide that at some point, but I, I okay, yes, I can provide that. Um, if you want to look at that more. Um, so she's using it, you know, to validate actual products. Like, should we go to market with this thing? But I've also found that this has been really effective to have terrible conversations or really scary, like a scary project. Like, how do you kick it off? How do you get stakeholders if there's a lot of people invested? How do you start a scary project? This is, like, a great activity to do because um, it's very high level. Um, and the way that it works is we all get post-its and then we all get together and, you know, you pick, you've got engineers there, you've got key stakeholders, all kinds of people. So what are we assuming about this? Are we, like, a, about the problem and the solution? And then what we're doing is we're focusing on our fears, like, this can't happen, I'm afraid this can't happen, or also where we're maybe confident or overly confident I'm sure that this will solve the problem. I think we can build this on time. Um, so, and that really helps because sometimes, especially with people who are specialists in the area, that, that like if we're working with financial specialists, they don't even realize they're making assumptions. So it's like, it's nice to kind of have this conversation where it's like, okay, so we're all on the same page right now. We're all just assuming this is going to work. Um, Let's make sure we validate that. So then we all agree, what are the riskiest, scariest ones? And then that's where I start my script for talking to customers. So it's really easy. It like does it for me um, to figure out what I need to talk about. So just like an example of this is, um, you know, the, so there's assumptions we make about the problem and assumptions we make about the solution we want to create. So my favorite one that comes up all the time is like, people care about this thing. People care this exists, or like people see the value in this in doing this thing. Um, the solution could be people will actually log into a website to tell us or finish this thing, or the solution could be we need it to be a setup flow and not a switch or something like that. So it's just kind of getting it all out there. Um, and so then we're using a jobs to be done framework for the interviews that we do at the beginning of big projects like this. So. In preparing for the interview, um, the, 
first thing to think about for me is that identifying what a customer's motivation is, is really different from usability. Um, I can test a lot of things with just about anyone, right? Because it should work and anyone should be able to use it. But in a case of I've got a list of 27 things and I don't know why certain people aren't doing them, it's kind of important to make sure that I'm like fighting against selection bias um, and getting a nice rounded out group of people from a lot of different backgrounds and, and experiences. So for us, um, you know, we've used tools like Ethneo um, or Qualaroo to like kind of go fishing on the website live to grab people, which is great. Um, but we notice it's we're skewing very young into a very specific demographic. So for us, we work with the data team actually, and we'll pull according to life phase to make sure. Like I don't, I want to talk to young people, but I also want to talk to parents in their 40s, and I want to talk to pre-retirees, and I want to understand the full picture. So we kind of make sure that we're pulling from all those groups, um, and then we prepare a plan and agree on it together and a script ahead. So. When I say jobs to be done, um, this is based off of Clay Christensen's milkshake marketing. Um, I'm not going to explain this whole thing right now, but there is links here too. I, I can share this. Um, it's super interesting. Um, it's basically that you know the idea is the customer is is not really buying your product; they're buying what they get from it. So I want to understand what they're trying to do in order to make the right thing. So that's my like destroyed version of that, uh, what this is. But um, so what I'm looking for in the interviews is I, I want to first identify when they first needed help. Like when did they realize they needed something like Betterment? Um, I also want to know what other tools they've tried. And I want to know what pushes them towards us and what pushes them away. Um, and also, I'm just interested to hear about the first thing they try to do after sign up because I feel like it's really illuminating um, just to see what the, what the behavior is there. So the way that it works, the framework works, is we think about, we trace the first thought through to what they call the complete switch. So when did they first have this idea, like, I should invest my money all the way through to, like, I'm using Betterment, I've converted and we focus on the moment of sign-up as the point at which um, we want to we understand what happened there and work backwards. So what's interesting, and it really does follow this pattern for us time and again, is that, okay, so also, so up here would be forces of progress and then forces of resistance. So things that push them towards us, things that push them away. There, is, there really does follow this pattern, though. So we find the first thought, and that is usually a period of passive looking. It's like, I should do this. I think I should do this. And then something happens, which makes you get more serious. And then there's more active looking. Like, I should really, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to start investing my money. And then a second thing happens. And then it's like, yes, this has to happen right now. And that's when they decide. So we were actually able to identify a lot of patterns about our customers this way. Um, and it's been really cool to get to talk to them about it. So just a couple of tips from some scrappy research uh, about writing good questions. So like the most like important thing is like not to ask them what they will do. So they're going to probably tell me something that's not correct. And it's not that they're trying to be willfully deceptive. Um, but I feel like it's like human nature. Like you want to say what the person wants to hear. Um, so that's why we focus on what they already did, because then I can put together a story of what they're actually doing and what they're, what they're likely to do based on my own perception of because of what they've done. Um, and then oh, don't supply answers in the questions. So I have some examples of that. I, I tend to do that uh, by nature, so I have to really practice to not do that. Um, and then also do wait longer than you could ever humanly imagine before offering a hint. So there's like this weird chasm of time that's like milliseconds, but it feels like forever. Um, so I like lay a question out there, and then it's like, I want to provide you a hint because I don't know. I, I, I'm afraid you can't answer the question. I don't know. I don't want to sit in silence. I don't know. But um, it's amazing. They just need a few beats, and they will provide an answer. So I think that that's been really important, too, to not skew things, to kind of just give them the space and let them talk. 
And I work really, like when we do it too, we want to establish a little bit of a rapport to get them to relax at the beginning. So we just kind of talk about them a little bit, hear about their background or whatever they feel like talking about and notice them open up. So, and, uh, and there's another good one too, like uh, don't, don't correct them. There was this one man I talked to um, who called us a robot advisor. So you know, I don't know if you've heard the term robo advisor is like the term. And he called us a robot. So I called us a robot the whole interview because I didn't want him to clam up. Like if I had told him, oh, no, it's not that, you know, he might have stopped talking to me or being honest with me. So uh, that was that's interesting, too. Um, okay, so this is an example of a question that's not so hot. So do you feel comfortable with the idea of investing online? So I'm providing the answer of comfortable. Um, I'm already telling you how I think you should feel. Um, and also I'm talking about the future. Like, would you do this thing? Um, so what we ask instead is, have you used any other websites or apps to manage your finances? Um, so now I'm learning about what they've done, and it tells me about their solution experience. Like, have, like if, if they've only ever used a spreadsheet, like, how likely are they to jump to, like, online investing? But if I uh, go through and ask them about how they do their banking and their banking online, and if they've tried a budgeting tool like Mint, that gives me another hint. Uh, how do they do their taxes? Do they do their taxes online? So if they're doing all of that, we're, we know they're sort of comfortable already with the idea. Um, so areas that we focus on when writing all these questions is, like, their financial context, like what are they, like do they invest at all? Like what is their experience with money in general? Um, this, their solution comprehension, so do they have any idea what they need to do to get help with the thing they need help with? So they have any clue, like what, or, or is it just like I have no idea? Um, identify the job that they want done from us. And then we will also dive into specific areas relating to whatever we're working on. So, like, if we were talking about t taxes, tax features, we would get more specific with that kind of stuff. So we would go through, write the script, um, and, and run through a bunch of uh, tests with customers. So I would, you know, six to eight, they say, is the magic number. But I would usually do those three age groups. So, you know, I'll talk to, to like over 20 people by the time it's done for a project like this. So now I have all of this great data, like how do I share this out? Um, so we just make sure with stakeholder meetings, like we just boil everything down to a few high level like sound bites um, that kind of get across what we're doing. We quantify the qualitative wherever possible. So, you know, if I you know, 50% of 20 people. Yeah, it's not a ton of people, but it is enough to start to get them to understand there's a pattern here. We've randomly sampled all of these people and half of them are not doing this. Like, that's an interesting pattern. Um, we've also found it super effective to highlight actual customer quotes. And this just has, like, made this connection for the company at large, and it's really helped to elevate why we do this work. Um, when they see this and they make connections, like, oh, my God, we're making this for a person. Because um, that can get lost really quickly. Um, and then I like to illustrate the, a few of the user journeys, so whatever those patterns are, just so we've got something to look at together. But I make all the raw data available. Um, so any of the notes, we've got several people taking. There's, like, different styles of taking notes now. We're trying, like, a Trello version. We're trying all kinds of things. Um, but then also the recordings. So... Um, yeah, so we make that available for anyone that wants to listen, and so we're really transparent about how we came to the conclusions we came to. So this is an example from this project. So these are a few job stories. So Judy uh, said to me, I want a seamless, low-cost solution to manage my assets with very little effort for me. So that was sort of part of the thing that jumped out, like, you know, this idea of hands-off. Um, and then Marie it was very similar. I'm testing a solution that eliminates my active involvement with my money. So now I'm like, okay, they want to not be making many decisions, which same Marie, totally get it. Um, I don't want to make a lot of decisions around my money either. <laughs> and then we also capture the fears that are behind it. So 
with Michael, he said to me, I, I feel like I don't even know how to ask the right questions, which is interesting because we got a list of 27 things. So even if he has a feeling like he should be doing something, he's just, he's, he's, you know, he's got a real fear around it, you know, not, not knowing what to ask. So can we anticipate with this list now, can we somehow anticipate what he actually wants to do? Um, that, that presented a really cool opportunity. And then it's scary to make financial decisions by myself, which again, same. So this was a really, this was the younger group. Sometimes we call them like early earners. Um, so this is a sort of illustration of, of where these people landed. So what was interesting and an overwhelming pattern with them was that they were like, they came to us and they were ready to roll over. So what that means is um, they have like a, an account at another institution, like a 401k or an IRA that they do not want at that institution anymore and they want to move that, in, that to betterment. And it was a like, large proportion of people at this age group were feeling that way. So when we map it out, so we sort of, they start to think about their finances, this group actually right after graduation, which hats off, again, I, I, I was not thinking about that right after graduation, but this group really was. But what, so what pulls them away? What's, a, what's you know, on the negative side? Well, they have debt, which everyone does. So they want to get started. They know they should, but there's like, you know, it's, it's should, I, should I pay off my debt first? And then the first event is your first switch job which leads to your first weird 401k that's like small and sitting by itself somewhere. Um, so that sort of starts to be like, all right, so now I'm, I'm getting more active. And what was interesting was this age group also, um, they do their research through blogs and books and podcasts. Like they're really into Mr. Money Mustache. I don't know if you guys have heard of him, but um, so that, that's how they would hear us on there. So that's like pushing them towards us. But then what's pulling them away is sort of the lure of the familiar. So I have my 401k is at this institution already. Like, I'm just going to leave it there. Like, I don't want to change anything. I don't know anything about any of this. I'll just consolidate it and leave it there. And then also there was even people whose families use traditional investment advisors. So they think, all right, I'm going to try that first. I'm going to talk to this advisor. Um, and the next thing was, like, it happened to all of them. They had some bad experience with one of these institutions. So we heard stories like a rollover was processed improperly, so they had huge fines and taxes that they had to pay. Um, or they realized when they rolled over their 401K, they had to pick all the assets to go inside of it. And they're like, I don't want to pick the assets. Like, also, you know, I can relate to that, and that's something that Betterment does for you. You don't have to choose any of the assets. We choose a portfolio for you. So that's when things got serious. Um, I was also surprised to learn that so many people talk to their friends and family about money, which I think is so interesting. Um, I, I don't know. I was, it was surprising to me, but there's sort of that social trust gets built. So we're still we're in blogs all the time, on podcasts all the time, so they would hear it. It would get reinforced. We would even hear from customers that were like, oh, yeah, I'm trying you guys, and my friend's trying your competitor, and we're comparing to see, like, how. I'm like, okay. I, it was really interesting. So um, so that was the moment of sign-up. So, you know, this speaks to those anxieties, like, did I make the right choice? Because this, right, I, I don't really know what I'm doing yet. I, I'm, like, a little nervous about this. Um, but then, you know, something about us that we heard was they liked how clean the design is and how simple it is, um, and that the idea of transparency and a much smaller institution, and we're not a big bank. Um, so that really resonates with this crowd as well, and that's when, like, the complete switch happened. What's interesting is that the list of 27 things, rollover was at the bottom because, or the end, because it felt like the biggest commitment, which is technically true. It is a big commitment. Um, but actually, they're in here, and they're like, I'm ready to go. And so we're not actually, we weren't servicing this group. We weren't providing enough information uh, right up front when, at the time of sign-up to, to enable you to do that. We thought you'd rather make a small deposit. When it turns out, they'd rather just get rid of this scary thing that they don't want to deal with anymore. Um, so, yeah, so that's an, an example of a story there. So... You know, uh, 
the next step, so this isn't, I'm not going to go into this, but we would do, like, this is when we would start to do ideation and paper prototyping. So we take all that information we learned from the customers and we bring that to the team and we bring our list of 27 items. So if we were working with a larger team, a larger group, like maybe some people from other expertise without the, throughout the company, like maybe someone from marketing and customer service would be there and there'd be some stakeholders there. We'd do like a top fives exercise, which is like a play on an IDEO exercise um, where everybody picks their top five of the 27 and then tells me what order they go in and who's going to use it and why are they going to use it. Um, and that helps us to sort of understand if we're all coming from the same place. We'll do ideation or paper prototyping like you see here for small, much smaller groups of people. Um, the idea is that we take what we've learned about the customer and bring it to the larger group. And that kind of does twofold. It, it helps to, to make sure that we're hearing from stakeholders and hearing from lots of people. But then also, these people are all hearing from the customer through us, which is really cool. Um, so then we would start testing with customers again. So we also did this thing, and we're, we're finding a new way of doing this now, um, where we would, to, we would get all this stuff, and it's like the designers are just like, we just have this information. I want to make sure it lives on. So um, this was an email. I don't know. It might not be an email anymore. We, we're going to find a different way to display it. But we would do this like customer of the week. We would highlight a story in a few lines of like one person and share what job we're doing for them and where we're missing the mark for this person and then make the recording available. And it was really, it's been really popular throughout the office too. People want to hear from the customers and they want to know what's going on. So that's how we would conduct like early level research on a project. Um, so, so thank you. I'm uh, really happy to be here again. Thank you. We are hiring across the entire company. So uh, I don't know. You can ask me about that, I guess. <laughs> so thank you so much.